Josiah, welcome along. It's good to have you back with us, mate. It's great to be here. We are talking about your column, Populism, Democracy, Stress Test. Now, populism is kind of this term that gets bandied about quite a bit, usually in the US, Mm -hmm. uh, usually around election time, which it is this, this year, it's election time. And it usually is kind of a term that's, you use when you don't like the, what the person on the other side of the political aisle is saying. You say, oh, you're such a populist, you know. And it has sometimes, it has overtones of nationalism, of anti-immigration, of all sorts of things that, um, you know, people don't really like. Yeah. Help us understand what this word means because I don't think it means what people think it means when they use it. So tell us, what is populism? Yeah, well, like you, when I hear populist or populism, my mind immediately goes to some nasty kind of politics mm. that you think sort of skinhead, you know, neo-Nazi, that kind of thing. Um, but actually, when you get down to what does populist or populism actually mean, well, if you're like me, you turn to Google and, 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 <laughs> and seek a definition. Um, yeah. And so Google's dictionary says populism is a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. Um, And so running with that definition, it actually becomes quite difficult to distinguish between populist politics and regular politics. Mm. After Mm. all, um, politicians within a democracy are vying for the votes of their electorate. So they want to be speaking their language and appealing to the things they care about. So that's what I was going to say. It seems like populism on that sense could just be campaigning by, like I think about uh, Christopher Luxon and Christopher Hipkins at our last election last year, you know, eating the sausage rolls, going out, talking to people like I'm an everyday person, vote for me because I know the struggles of the everyday person. Is that what populism is or is there something a bit more to it? Because it seems like centrist parties want to appeal to as broad a range of people as they can. Is that is that populism? Yeah, I think you're touching on it. Mm. I think populism, by definition, does appeal to the everyday citizen, the kind of ordinary person and and their concerns. So that's really part of it. I think in some ways what sets apart a populist politician from an ordinary politician is this idea of being up against an elite group or established elite groups. Um, You're thinking sort of government, academia, media, those kinds of groups. And so really sort of their approach is to tell to tell this ordinary group who have, you know, a collective interest in a given issue or issues and say, look, the people in power, they don't listen to you, they aren't listening to you. They won't listen to you. In fact, they actually despise you. Um, and so really the only way we're going to fix this is if you, if you vote for me and for my party, we'll come in here and we'll fix it. Um, so so that's really- it, Yeah, it's more of an antagonism approach then. It's more of a combative thing. So it's not like, hey, I understand you. Let's talk and we'll sort out how we can make this country better. But it's more like, I understand you. Everyone else who's in power hates you. We need to kick them out. So it's more of a- I think it's, yeah, a populist leader is someone who identifies an enemy and goes after them. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's that's probably one of the, the, the defining traits. So who would be some populist leaders that maybe we've seen? Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of uh, popular ones. The ones that come to mind would be um, Hitler, yeah. Mussolini, yeah. Um, and interesting – Interesting to note, these people arose within democratizing societies. Yep. So it's not like democracy is inherently safe. Um, yes. It's not the, the will of the people doesn't always constitute the good. Yes. Um, and so that, again, that's where we start to creep into uh, danger with populist leaders is they might speak the people's language and appeal to them. But the reason why we have the constitution we do, uh, the Western liberal tradition, is to protect the civil liberties of all people, mm. including minorities. Mm. And so the risk is that if a populist leader arises, they'll actually end up coming along and squashing you know, minority rights, which are actually the, the rights of all people. Yeah. But, it's, but it's easy for um, you know, a leader with the majority to go, actually, this group of people we don't like, we're going to target them in whatever way that may be. So do you have an example, maybe a more modern example of someone who is a populist leader has maybe done well, but there's maybe the danger that they're skirting some of those constitutional guardrails, I guess you'd call them. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think he's both a good example and a bad example at the same time. And that's the president of El Salvador, yeah. uh, Nayib Bukele. Um, so he he came into office and he really cracked down on some of the gang violence that was you know, rife throughout El Salvador. So that was his populist platform. To well, get basically, in. look, the people in power are doing nothing about this terrible, uh, basically, it's a gang crime pandemic. It's just, yeah. you know, Everywhere throughout society, people can't, you know, live their, their lives properly. They can't, you know, go about their business, can't feel safe when they're going out. So he says, you know, well, I'm going to come and I'm going to sort that out. And so he does. He cleans up the streets um, in some pretty impressive but also slightly scary ways. Mm. Uh, and so El Salvador goes from being one of the most dangerous countries in South America to one of the safest, you know, just through the course of him being president. Mm. Now, the El Salvadorian constitution stipulates that you can only serve one term and then you must take a break. So mm. you can't have two consecutive terms. Okay. Um, and so he stood for a second term. Which he shouldn't have done. Well, not by the constitution, yeah, yeah. no. Um, but he received an overwhelming majority of the votes, 83%. So people really yeah. liking what he's doing because yeah. he's clearly having an impact, tangibly improving the lives of everyday El Salvadorians. Mm. Um, but when it came to, I guess, the question of the constitutionality of this issue, um, the court, which was full of his supporters, suggested, well, actually, if you take a leave of absence and you come back, then it's fine, actually. You can sit this second term because it's not technically, you know, it's not yeah. te technically uh, a successive uh, or consecutive. Um, so in early, I think it was early this year, maybe January, he stepped down, yeah. uh, took his leave of absence, and then was sworn in in June. Okay. Um, so you're like, well... It still seems pretty unconstitutional yeah. to me. Um, but there is case in point, right? He's fixed a problem that people really did care about and was a problem. So we can all agree, yep, cracking down on this crime issue is a good thing. Yeah. But he's done it in a way that's unconstitutional. And so whilst the outcome might be good in the here and now, really you are opening yourself up to political instability in the future mm. because you're actually bringing into question the legitimacy of the constitution, which you've all agreed to, you know, abide by the rules. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like when things are going well, you can say, well, these rules, they're more like guidelines, yeah. really. They're not hard and fast. And since we're doing okay, we can just put them aside. But the danger is that you set a precedent and that if someone who is maybe not as, um, what should we say? Magnanimous. Magnanimous is a good word. Yeah, virtuous, uh, focused on the good of the country, uh, comes along, someone who wants to keep power, then maybe that sets a precedent for them to go, well, actually, we put those aside before and I think I'm fine, so I'm going to put those aside and I'm just going to keep power. Well, if the constitution's been overridden once, what's to stop it being done again? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it may even reach a point where you don't even need to appeal to a state of emergency or anything that might sort of grant you a sense of legitimacy from the people to mm. do that. Mm. Um, and so I, I think that's where we go, okay, we need to be hearing all people Yeah. Um, because if you don't, you're actually encouraging the conditions for a populist leader to arise. So it's mm. important that we hear people to, to avoid some of the extremes. Mm. Um, but equally when those people arise, we need to be super sharp and go, actually, we need to be careful about a sort of a majoritarian tyranny that, you know, that may be imposed. Mm. Um, Professor Tom S Simpson spoke recently um, of a post-World War II realization among, among intellectuals that actually, quote, um, it would be the people, not primarily in constitutions or technologies, who must be responsible for sustaining a just and stable political order. Wow, that's um, fascinating. Yeah. So, so I think in there is something quite profound. Actually, we need to have a respect for our institutions and for our political system. Even if we don't like the results, which is fine, you don't have to like the results, but you actually you still need to abide by by these set, sets of political principles that mm. dictate the way our system works. It, you know, we, we do politics not by bloodletting but by debate. Mm. Um, but there is a risk that you could devolve into mm. something a little bit darker. So it's kind of like we have these systems that are supposed to guard us, but actually it comes down to in the end, uh, if I'm understanding Professor Simpson correctly. It comes down to the fact that the people within those systems still have to be virtuous enough, um, self-controlled enough, mm. self-aware enough even to abide by those systems yeah. for the good of not only the now but the, the nation going forward. Yeah. Yeah, and if I could just quickly illustrate with Winston Peters as New yeah. Zealand's beloved populist. Yes. Um, in 2022, February, he attended the parliamentary occupation. Yeah. This was at a time where 
parliament refused to engage with the protesters mm. um, and some members were actually, you know, antagonistic toward them. Mm. Um, we remember Trevor Mallard who, you know, turned the sprinklers on yeah. and uh, played Baby the Shark. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so you've got that. Um, I don't know whether you've seen uh, the documentary River of Freedom. No. Um, there's, a, there's a section there within the documentary where archival footage is deployed of um, – Michael Wood, um, and he talks about sort of basically how this protest, you know, there are some misunderstood people there who, who have concerns and we should we should care about them, mm. but really what runs through it is a river of filth. Yeah, yeah, um, wow. So, so, so you've got that and then instantly, bang, cut to Winston Peters who <laughs> strolls into a crowd of protesters who are obviously yeah. angry and concerned, yeah. and, and he says to them, look, you know, I, I couldn't believe that Parliament should unanimously say we're not going to talk to the protesters. Yeah. And so, you know, Q slash note to what I said earlier. Mm. He's saying, look, the people in power, they're not listening to you. They despise you. And the protests are going, yeah, well, I see that. Clearly they're playing they baby do. shark, yeah. deploying sprinklers, yeah. etc. Calling us a river of filth. Yeah. Precisely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm I'm actually gonna come and represent you, vote vote for me. Yeah. Um one of the the protesters gathered there, um, he said, if democracy is a conversation and politicians don't want to have the conversation, what are we all doing here? Yeah. Uh, and that's and that's a real great question. You know, democracy is about having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Um democracy isn't perfect and there are some guardrails we need to maintain. Yeah. But I mean it, democracy should work as a pressure release valve. Yeah. It shouldn't build up into, you know, what could end up, you know, being some kind of violent demonstration. Mm. That's something we really want to avoid. Yeah. It's interesting you use that example because who's our current deputy prime minister? Well, right, you know. So, so populism not a not a terrible thing, not a great thing. Needs to be used and utilized, or maybe made self aware a little bit. Um, great thoughts, Josiah. Thanks for thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Jason. Populist has become a catch all term. It can mean anything from racist nationalist, authoritarian, anti-establishment, to less controversially, a kind of politics centred around the concerns of everyday citizens. The difference between populist politics and regular politics is difficult to discern. Both approaches strive to make the voice of the people heard. According to Google's dictionary, populism is a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. This is why President Barack Obama could say his political platform made him a populist. It all comes down to whom the appeal is made. If a group sees themselves as ordinary citizens and feels their views are not represented within their political institutions, then it's populist. New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters wears the label proudly, quote, Populism means that you're talking to the ordinary people and you're placing their views far higher than the beltway and the paparazzi, or dare I say the bureaucracy, end quote, he said in 2020. This kind of politics works by telling people without power that those who have it aren't listening and are actively working against their interests. Consider the 2016 US elections, where both Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders and billionaire real estate tycoon Donald Trump made populist appeals to ordinary Americans by blaming elites for the nation's problems. Thus, populism can be right or left-wing. But here's where it gets interesting. Minority politics is populist politics, either numerically or representatively. COVID-19 was undoubtedly the driving factor behind Mr. Peter's return to office. He quite literally went where others feared to tread by meeting protesters who made up a minority of the population at the anti-mandate occupation of Parliament in February 2022. River of Freedom, a documentary about the occupation, deploys archival footage of Michael Wood dismissing the protest as a quote, river of filth, the perfect foil for Winston Peters' cameo. Speaking to a crowd of protesters, he said, I couldn't believe that Parliament should unanimously say we're not going to talk to the protesters. In the words of one parliamentary occupier, if democracy is a conversation and politicians don't want to have the conversation, what are we all doing here? Of course, let's not discount the allure of populists, nor their danger. It's worth remembering that 20th century fascism took root in democratising societies. If we want to avoid problematic populist politics, then our elites must deign to listen when outsiders speak. Should they refuse and a popular figure arises, the only thing that will protect against tyrannical majoritarianism 
is due respect for our institutions and political traditions. And where does that come from? Us, the people. Professor Tom Simpson recently spoke of the post-World War II realisation among intellectuals that, quote, it would be people, not primarily constitutions or technologies, who must be responsible for sustaining a just and stable political order. Populism isn't inherently bad, but it does need self-awareness and channeling. When it comes to preserving our political system, we should all be populists. (laughs) 